Amen. Amen. I said, Amen. Amen. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Well, in your Bibles this morning, we're going to make this real easy. I want you to go to Genesis 1-1. Amen, we're going to make this real easy today. One of the very first things that the Bible mentions is located in Genesis 1 and 1. Amen. Bless you. Amen. In Genesis 1-1, it gives us an idea of the maker or the manufacturer because it's one thing that's throughout the theme in Genesis 1 and 2. And there's two words that he uses exclusively. And he uses create and made. Create and made. So in Genesis 1-1, it says, in the beginning, why don't y'all finish that for me? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, notice who was in the beginning, God. And God being in the beginning, there wasn't nothing there but him. So in order to create We've got to understand that there's just one creator. And the creator can only create when there's nothing. When there's nothing. I said a creator can only create when there's nothing. Now, in order to make something, something had to have been created before it was made. Okay, now let's get, okay. Everybody turn your head sideways. Now turn it the other way. <laughs> now let me do this again. <laughs> In order for something to be made, it had to have been created first. In the beginning, there was God. And God created... <laughs> Oh, you're good. That's okay. Yeah. And it said God created. And what did he create? The heavens and the earth. And what did God make these things from? Nothing. There ain't nobody else who can make something out of nothing. And you want to know how come we praise God? Because ain't nobody like him. The psalmist says, is there, any, is there anybody out here like God? And then he said this. He said, I made the celestial Oh, okay, I, I get excited. Huh? I made the celestial and then transferred it into the telestial. In other words, he made the heavens and the earth. And what he made in heaven, he wanted to transfer it here on earth. And the only way he could do that was to create something and then make something out of what he had created. Hunt your neighbor and say, is anything too hard for God? I, I, I'm telling you this because what we have just experienced in this place today, only God could do that. I said, only God can do that. So my motivation for being here today is that the faith in me might rise up to the level where God can not only do something for me, but God can also do something through me. Because it ain't about me, and it ain't about you. It's about God. It's about Jesus. Now, further down the line, we, you look at this word. Somebody showed me a word this morning, thank God. It's logos. And logos is 
is a term that's used for the written word. But logos in its, in its formal meaning means expressed thought. Okay, everybody say expressed thought. Express thought. So Jesus was actually an expressed thought of God. I say everybody cough. <laughs> I don't want nobody choking this morning. So Jesus was the express thought of God. That's why when the Bible says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then further down the line in chapter 1 he said let us make man in our own image. And then translate that into John 1.1. 1, 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. So what was Jesus? He was in the mind of God. Say this to me, everybody. I have, I have the, mind the mind of Christ. Because God's got this stuff called wisdom. He's got this stuff called wisdom that he says that everything that happens in your life, you can apply wisdom and it will be you putting my mind on whatever it is that's happening with you. In other words, God has the answer key and his name is Jesus. So when you start putting your thoughts about you all over the place, and not have your thoughts directed at Jesus and what Jesus has done for you, you're not using correct wisdom. Okay. Everybody say it's all about Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Now, in your Bibles, I want you to go to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis 18. And I won't be before you long. I'm going to segue right into communion today. And go to verse 14. And I, I, I you know, just a, the, the very A part of that scripture, and it says this. You, everybody got it? If you got it, say, I got it. Okay, Genesis 18, 14. It says this. It, it, it asks a question, and it says this. And it, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Now, I, here's the thing. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? And the answer would be no. So what makes you not believe that what you're going through now, God can't get you out? What is it that makes us now vacillate between believing God? Everybody said they believed him. So when you get in trouble, when, you, when that addiction gets on your back, when there's trouble in your home, when your wife ain't acting right, when your husband ain't acting right, when your kids ain't acting right, is there anything... God. Too hard for God? Well, something must get in our way. Something must get in our way because all of a sudden you sweating everything that's going on in your life. Hunter David says, stop tripping. Stop tripping. Yeah, you trip over every, the least little thing. You get a $24 water bill and you trip. <laughs> And we read here, ain't nothing too hard for God. If God, the first characteristic of God, listen, is that God was a creator. First thing it says about God, and God created. So the first thing God becomes to us is a creator. Anybody in here ever created something? No, you ain't never created nothing. Yeah, you create, I, I thank you for, I heard it over here. You created a mess. That's what you created. And then when you created a, look, and when you created a mess, the first one you called on was the creator. That's true. So there must be something about God that you know that he can fix everything that's going on in your life. But we wait until things just get all chaotic. You wait till everybody cussing you out. <laughs> See, some of y'all must have been cussed out. <laughs> you, wait until, you wait in your life until everything is topsy-turvy. Everybody say, and then. And then. 
And see, and then you want to call on God. Every person in you has this intrinsic thing within themselves that they think they can fix their own life. And most of us have tried. You done tried everything you know how. Well, I don't feel good today. Let me go get me a bag. <laughs> Ain't that real talk? Yes. Now, for those of you who ain't went and got a bag, you went and got a bottle. Right, right. See, everybody in here going, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> you done went to somebody, or you done went to something other than the one who had the answer to your problem. You done got on the phone and called Tyrone <laughs> when things were going bad in your life. Tyrone, is that you? <laughs> Let me tell you what's going on. And they don't even have an answer to your problem. <laughs> but God, the creator, has the answer, listen, yes. to every problem that's going on in your life. Yes. Wow. Now, is there anything too hard for God? No. And God's a creator, yes? Yes, yes God's a creator. Now, go into your Bible, so... Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Let's start with verse 25. I'm going to read this morning. You can just follow along with me, and we'll all end up in the same place at the right time. All right. Verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith, therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added yes. to you. Now, I, I want to deal with three basic things in verse 33. And then we'll move on this morning. The first thing is the first thing. Because he tells us that the first thing he wants us to do is to seek. In other words, he's saying it ain't going to come to you. You got to go after it. Okay, which indicates some kind of pursuit on our part. And then he uses the word first, which says, before you do anything else, yeah. this is what you see. Right. Hunter David said, this ain't, hard. this ain't hard. Then the third thing he talks about is the kingdom, which is the object of our pursuit. In other words, seek first the kingdom. Everybody say, seek first the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom. No, and then he tells us, and his righteousness, and righteousness has to do with positioning. Okay, everybody say, I'm all right with God, I'm all right with God. and God's all right with me. All right with me. Yeah, I'm the apple of God. You, you meet with the apple of God's eye. God's got our best interests at heart. When we talk about the manufacturer, you, I've been saying this all for about three or four weeks now. When I go into the mind of the manufacturer, which is reading the manual, God tells me what's best for me. And he said, the best thing for me to do is not to go after the things, but to go after the kingdom. 
So, I want you to say this with me this morning. I'm not going. I'm not going. No, let me, let me switch that. Say, I'm not seeking. I'm not seeking. Money, stuff, and things. Money, stuff, and things. I'm seeking. I'm seeking. I'm going after. I'm going after. God. God. Now, l listen to this. Because he says that if I do these, if I seek after the kingdom of God and his righteousness, what happens? All these things shall be, I like this, added unto me. Now, how much time have we wasted going after money, stuff, and things? Why do y'all want to talk about money? Well, I talk about money because you talk about money. Because that's what you worry about all the time. I guarantee I could scan this room from the left to the right, and at some point all week long, you done thought about some money. Or some stuff. Or some things. Amen. At some point, you have sought, you have worried about those things, and God says, don't worry about them. Seek the kingdom, listen, and I'll add them to you. But we spend most of our day, our day seeking the money, stuff, and things, and not going after God. We've got our priorities shifted, and God wants to shift back to seeking his kingdom and his righteousness. And how in the world do we do that? That becomes a question. How in the world do I put God first place in my life? Well, I, I, can y'all work, work with me today? Okay, close your eyes. Yeah, when your eyes are closed, what do you see? Everybody say, I knew everybody was going to say, nothing. Okay, now, I want you to picture in your mind's eye today the very first thing that comes to your thought life. The very first thing. See, some of y'all won't close your eyes. Look at that. You scared of what you're going to see with you? <laughs> Yeah, now, okay, now open your eyes. Now, let me tell you something. Now, everybody open, now close them again. Now, I want you to see Jesus. Just see Jesus in all of his splendor, in all of his wonder. Now, open your eyes up. Now, if you didn't open your eyes up, that means you fell asleep when you... Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Mama Lou. <laughs> now, now, look, what I'm, what I'm saying is this. Seeking, pursuing, means that I got my eyes fixed on something. I can only go after what I fixate my mind on. And that's the thing I'm going to be going after. Why? Because he is the creator. And now I go to the book of Psalm and I find out all the characteristics of a creator. What kind of characteristics does God have that he has shared with me? You don't have to go very far. Everybody take in a deep breath. Hold it. Now look at that. See? See? I didn't have to tell you to breathe, did I? And see, this is where we miss God. God has intrinsically put his voice down on the inside of us, and sometimes we miss it because we don't want to hear what he got to say. So when he tells you, seek me first, Ain't it easy to get off that script and start thinking about all the stuff you don't have? Yeah. <laughs> and it consumes your whole, yeah. yours, my, it consumes our whole thought life. And all of a sudden, I get back into kingdom mismanagement, thinking now that I got to do something yeah. in order to get something. That is true. 
when all God has told me, seek first the kingdom. Seek first. Stop trying to work for the stuff because you can't work for it. You'll never get it by working. Listen to this. You work, God rests. You rest, God works. Well, you don't know what I'm going through. I might not know, but God does. I say God does. Everything that happens in your life, listen, God gives you a way of escape. Everybody go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Man, he almost done already? I sure am. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Who said that's good? Over here? Oh, cuz. Boy, he, he done slept half of it anyway. He ain't gonna... <laughs> so look, even when I get hey, even when I get done, he ain't gonna know. <laughs> Hallelujah. I love you, Ernie. I love you. I love you. Hey man, see, I can't say that to everybody. I can I can I can talk to him. Yeah. Okay, 10, 13, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, all right? Now, I'm, I'm going to segue because everybody wants God to operate, amen? Amen, everybody knows that God is a creator. And what we're going to read now is that there's nothing going on in your life that God has not given you a way out. Everybody said nothing. nothing. Ain't nothing going on in your life that God has not given you a way out of. And I'm going to show you this morning just how that works. All right, he said, no, ooh, I like the way it starts. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. Look, and listen at this. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Ain't Everybody say context. context. Ain't it amazing? that he talks about temptation and the way of escape. And in the very same thought, he gives you communion. Very same contextual thought, he says he'll give you the way of escape, not a way, the way. And he said, the cup of blessing in 16, which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? Now, if you tied it up into a sweet little knot, Brother Irvin, you can't get away from the fact that communion is all about your way of escape. And, now, go to... Uh, oh, give me a break. Give me a Give me a minute. Oh, I know I had it. Oh, I got it right here. Uh, go, <laughs> go, go to verse 24. Well, go to verse 23, 10, 23. 11, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 11, 23. We're going to go back to 10, but right now go to 11. Verse, chapter 11, verse 23. 
He says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, listen, which is broken for you. And what's the last thing he says? Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. Not of what's going on with you. Everybody say, think about Jesus. Now, when we talk about the way of escape, the implication is this, that if I need a way out, if I think about him, he'll give me the way. The only way we can't find the way is because our eye in the midst of temptation is never on him. It's always on the way out. Oh, please. I'm looking for the way out. And what I ought to be looking at is Jesus. And if I look at pay attention to him, he'll show me the way out. Now, I know this might be a foreign term for a lot of us because I'm introducing most of us in here this morning to a very new concept about new covenant keys. And the new covenant key says, God made the heavens and the earth, and then he gave the keys to earth to me. So everything I need here. He gives me a key to open the door. Come on. Amen. But I got to know which door and which key to use. Now, when I'm t- anybody in here ever been tempted? Anybody in here ever succumbed to temptation? Yeah. Anybody in here ever felt bad after you succumbed to the temptation? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, if. <laughs> Now listen, so if you kept your mind on the temptation and on the succumbing, then you are missing the very blessing that God has through the experiential knowledge that you have of succumbing to temptation. Everybody say thoughts. Thoughts, ideas, ideas. and suggestions. If the enemy can keep you locked into that, man, he got you. He got you. And right now, just because I mentioned it, some of your memories are going back to some temptation moments that you succumbed to. Hunter David said, forget about that. Yeah, because what? Because, listen, because Jesus... Everybody say Jesus. Jesus Jesus bore that sin on the cross. And I'm keeping my hand raised. Because most of the time, if the enemy can keep you locked into what you did, it's going to keep you from thinking about what God, excuse the English, what God do. Because God sent Jesus to die for your past, present, and future sins. So if I can, if the church or whomever can keep you locked into old covenant believing, you'll carry the guilt of your sins for the rest of your life. And you'll block the grace of God from happening in your life when you're remembering all the sins that you have committed. And Jesus became, listen, Jesus became the very punishment for your sin. Everything that he bore on the cross was for us. But I don't think about us. 
I think about him. Urban mentioned this one. How many people know therapy make you feel good? And I've said this before, therapy make you feel good. God delivers you. Amen. Uh, but what about that? I ain't got nothing against therapy. You can talk to, ooh, let's see how bad that is. You can talk to a tree and make you feel good. See, I need to talk to the one that ain't nothing too hard for. You know, most, most therapists, and you know, again, please don't get me wrong, I ain't got nothing against therapists, but most therapists will do something like this, I hear you say. <laughs> yes, I hear you say. And you know, I've been there, and I'm saying, I'm, I'm one of those skeptics. <laughs> Anybody know me too? I'm one of those skeptics. I hear you say, well, I guess you did. You know the one I'm in here talking to. <laughs> You know, don't, don't, don't try that on me. I've been to Jesus. Okay. <laughs> but he says, look, listen, do this in remembrance of me. Everything we do today has nothing to do about you. It's about Jesus and what he did at the cross for us. You see where we missed it? I'll tell you, I was going to segue this right into communion this morning. You see where we missed it? We missed it in the very table that's supposed to be our way out. We've seen it and limited people who even can receive it. Because we've always heard, and I don't know, I came from a Baptist church, and most of you in here came from one of those kind of churches. It says, don't drink unworthy. And if you've got any sin in your life, then don't receive, don't, don't, you, don't you mess with that cup. If that had been the case, we still have grape juice in the refrigerator. Because there ain't nobody in here ain't made some kind of slip up in their life. Now, how in the world could we fall for that? Well, I'll tell you how come we fell for it. It was doctrine and tradition. And most of the time, from pulpits like this, people taught doctrine and tradition and not new covenant believing. Come on, Grace. See, what we've been teaching you is relationship, not religion. That's right. So when we come in here, we offer the table to you, and we tell you that this is for everybody in here. The only thing you have to do is get that unworthy thing straight. Because the Bible does not say that you're unworthy. It says you receive in an unworthy manner. Everybody say the way of escape. escape. Yeah, the way of escape comes through discerning the Lord's body. And discerning the Lord's body means, come on, everybody been to church in here. You come communion time, just give me the cup, give me the bread. And you take it as one big communion. No, the Bible says, discern the Lord's body. The, if Jesus had not had you and I on his mind, he would have went straight to the cross. But instead, he went through and got scourged first, got beat up first, and then he went to the cross. So on that note, he was whipped For us. Every stripe that he bore was for your healing. Was for our healing. So what do I have to get out of my head that what it's not manifested in our body. Irvin and I go through this all, we, we talk about this all the time. See, you, you want to know something? You might not think you're thinking about something but it's really in there. So when the Bible says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, you know, I would venture to say a lot of us in here have not had complete mind renewal, which keeps you from receiving, because every time I think about my, how bad it hurt, I'm not thinking about the stripe that he bore. I'm thinking about how bad it hurt. And he said, do this in remembrance of me, not about how bad you hurt. 
Sure, you're hurting, but get your mind off your pain and put your mind on Jesus. Why? Because that's what he said. I believe the Bible from the book table of contents to the book of maps. Oh, oh well, if you do, <laughs> well, if you do, he says, do this in remembrance of me, not in remembrance of you. We've gotten so accustomed to just repeating everything we hear. What about your personal relationship with God and you talking to God for yourself? Why you got, now I, I'm, I'm one of those one, two, three people. Everybody here knows. I have you repeat this after me. Yeah, but at some point, do you realize that that sticks in your head and all of a sudden it becomes yours and not mine? It's called repetitious thinking and saying. I tell them in the classroom all the time, you learn your timetables through repetitious information. Yeah. Every day you went to school, one time one is one, one times two is two, one times two. Yeah, and now you even know what 12 times 12 is without even thinking about it. Right. See, didn't even have to think about it. You didn't have to decipher. You didn't have to go naught time, naught equal naught, naught, carry to naught. You didn't have to do that because you knew it through repetitious information. Well, listen, ladies and gentlemen, the word of God acts the same way. Joshua said this, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate. Meditate. And meditate don't just mean that you sit here and go, mm -hmm. That ain't meditating. Meditate means to mutter. Yeah, you got to be saying something. See, people, see, people thought I was tripping when I said that. Everybody said you got to be saying something. The thing is, what are you saying? Oh, you didn't get that. The trouble is, what are you saying? If faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, then I only not hear what comes out of somebody else's mouth. I also hear what comes out of my mouth. Because you have two sets of ears. You have an inner ear and an outer ear. That's how come you don't, when you listen to a tape recorder, you say, is that me? Yeah, it was you. <laughs> but you ain't been listen, you, you're not used to listening to yourself with that ear. Now, everybody say, do this, do this. In, remembrance in remembrance of Jesus. Of Jesus. I guarantee you, that when you leave here today, if you would intentionally focus on Jesus, everything in your life will not have as much meaning as it did before today. It won't carry as much weight as it does before you started here today. Well, what about praise and worship? We, we did that. Yeah, thank God for it. Put your shades up, man. Put your shades back on. Let me see. I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show y'all something. Urban, look back there. Yeah, you know, I, I'm no. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you this. I never saw. Now I, I watch. I watch y'all a lot. I never saw your dad any more prouder of you than I saw this morning. Yeah, that was kudos to you, boy. I, I'm serious. You know, you know and, and sometimes, see, what, what we want to do here, we want to encourage you. This ain't a place to tear you down. You've been torn. I used to go to churches. I felt worse when I left than when I came. Beat me up. About it. Beat me up. Had me walking. I said, dang. So next Sunday... It was, listen, next Sunday it was easy for me not to go. <laughs> Should I go, all they're going to do is just beat me up. You know, take the Bible, I got whipped Bibles thrown at me. Everybody said the love of God. 
See, this thing is not about, listen, this thing is not about rules and regulations. It's about relationship. I learned it the hard way. Whatever they told me not to do, when I, by the time I walked out the door, that's exactly what I wanted to do. <laughs> Don't fornicate. Shoot, let me find me a, let me find me another fornicator. <laughs> Hey, come on now, because you know they, they all flock together. See, some of y'all looking at me like, would he hurry up? Yeah, I'm gonna hurry up. But all you gotta do is think about it. When they told you not to do it, that's what you did. I guarantee you, I could put a sign on that door right now that says, do not go in this door. And I know somebody gonna walk up there and do like this. Because, look, listen, you are, in, you, you are wired that way. That's a fleshly wiring. That's how come the enemy had no trouble with Eve. Because the first thing he do, did was this. Now, you know God ain't say that. See, I told him something in class the other day. I, I told him this. I said, everything in the Bible is truly stated. But everything in the Bible ain't true. Shut up. He <laughs> said, I tell you, she's like a broken refrigerator. She can't, she can't hold nothing. And see, I, I got them thinking because now you have to understand, you have to get in here for yourself. Don't go by what other folk have been telling you. Pastor John, how come you always want us to have your Bible? I told the other day. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 1. Mary had a little lamb. <laughs> His fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Yeah, the part, yeah. yeah, and you were reading like you were reading along with me. You was reading like, uh, yeah, he, he, here he is right here. And it ain't nowhere in here. Look, I don't care if Irvin's preaching. I'm pre I don't care who's preaching. I, look, I need to rightly divide the word of truth. And the only way I'm, listen, the only way I'm going to do that is to see it. Right here, right here. Man, Man you've been hoodwinked and bamboozled long enough. Right. You know, God ain't healing no more. Who in the world told you that? In the mind of God, he wants everybody well. So you won't let some doctrine and tradition steal your healing and your health from you just by what somebody thought and what somebody said? That's doctrine and theology. I, you know, most of us have been to the cemetery. I mean, seminary. <laughs> so this whole thing, it goes with a personal relationship with God not religion this thing as a matter of fact go to woman I wrote it down hold on man now I can't find it uh, hold, hold on hold on um, yeah go to Matthew 24 Kathy what you laughing at <laughs> You're gonna make me think something wrong with you up here. We're going, oh, okay, because we're about to I was about to call Irvin and have him sit over and lay hands on you. <laughs> Matthew. Ha ha ha. Yeah. Matthew 24, go to verse 14, I think. Matthew 24. Is that what? Hold on, don't, don't get it yet. Matthew 24. Yeah, yes, that's, that's it. Matthew 24, 14. Okay, now what, uh, what, what I want to show you. Did I look like Irvin? Did I look? Like 
Okay, now, the, the, thing that, <laughs> the thing that builds belief in the body is hearing the right thing. Okay, everybody say the right thing. The right thing. Now, I believe that the church or the, the fivefold ministries that God has planted in the church for the edification of the saints, for the building of the saints, has been misdirected. It's what I believe personally. And I was one of the biggest perpetuators of the misdirection. Before I knew. Everybody said before he knew. Before. Yeah, I used to preach everything. I used to preach about Mary had a little lamb. Mary <laughs> had a little lamb. Not a big lamb, but a little lamb. Itty bitty lamb. Dang. I'm going to turn this thing off. Right. Yeah, that's it. See, I, I, I preach that kind of stuff. Didn't even have to go to a scripture. If you could hoop, and they'd just be like, oh, yeah! Yeah, Mary had a little. <sighs> well, 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 well. I feel my help coming on. <laughs> and we sat there just, Mama Lou, we sat there just going, yeah! And I was just as dumb when I left as when I came. I knew about Mary and the little lamb, but I knew nothing about Jesus. Now, I have been prefacing my sermons with this. The Bible is about a king and a kingdom. Okay, now everybody got 14? Listen to this and see if this makes any sense to you. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Now, what does that say? Well, every time there's a tsunami, or the world coming to an end, or an earthquake, ooh, the world coming to an end. 9-11, ooh, that's a sign that the world is coming to an end. I'm going to tell you right now, that ain't what the scripture says. This scripture says that the, end's gonna, the, the end is not up to anybody else but us. He says when this gospel, and what is this gospel? It's the gospel of the new covenant of Jesus Christ. Not a mixture, little old, little new. No, he said the new covenant. When that gospel is preached to all the nations, then the end will come. So y'all might as well close your prophetic books, looking for earthquakes and tsunamis and Rumors of wars and all of that. No, he said the end gonna come when the this gospel. See, we preach every other gospel but this gospel. We preach the prosperity gospel, and there ain't no such thing as a prosperity gospel. Why? Because Jesus meant for everybody in here to be rich. Dum da dum dum. I heard the door close again, boy. I heard it. See, God wanted everybody in here to prosper. Yes. And how do you prosper? He, I, told, I started out, seek first the kingdom. That's how you prosper. Stop worrying about what you ain't got. I told the other day, man, I could, I could tell y'all about some lean times. Lean times. Me and my wife, you know, that was the time we, we had to split a hot dog. Come on now. I know some of y'all are well to do. Or do the well. <laughs> One of the two. Mama Lou, I told him last Sunday. I remember, see, we, we were rich. We had two TVs in our house. Although one of them didn't have sound 
and the other one didn't have a picture. So when we cut both of them on at the same time, I had stereo. <laughs> See, some of y'all here, you know, come on, you know, and my, my kids, you, you have one kid to hold the antenna. <laughs> and you got to move a little bit to the left, move to the left. <laughs> Just so you could get a clear picture. See, we always had LEDs and flat screens. Lord Jesus, if we'd have had a flat screen, we never would have seen TV. Couldn't have hung both TVs on the wall. <laughs> See, some of y'all in here laughing because you remember. Okay, but look how, listen, look how far God has brought you. I said, look how far he brought you. Yeah, I don't have to go home now looking for a wish sandwich. Wish there was some meat. <laughs> Mama Lou, you know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I know. Yeah, see, I, I'm, I'm glad. You know, you know, and Urban said that, you know, he, he, he looking straight ahead like, you know. Everybody say mercy. mercy. Everybody say grace. grace. Man, that wasn't nothing but the grace of God that saw us through those kinds of times. But this gospel, I, I, I listen, I'm, a, I'm a great observer, I'm a great listener, and I listen to people all the time when they tell me where God has brought them from. And every now and then, everybody say every now and then, you got to think back to where he brought you from. To help you, help you appreciate what you got now. It's called thank you. I said it's called thank you. Stand to your feet. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope you got something today. I, 